What's up guys, Mike the Cop, we're here at Columbus Police Aviation Unit today. We're gonna take you outside, inside, around, and up in the air in one of their police helicopters. I think you're gonna like it. I'll start with the history of the Columbus Police Department's aviation unit. It started um, back in the 1970s um, with helicopters that were piston driven, um, slow, but they were so effective at being a force multiplier is what they call it. Um, the job, the helicopter could do the job of about 20 officers um, with any type of search you can imagine. So they saw the benefit of it and they continued with the program. So back in the 1970s all the way until today, we end up with a MD-530F model helicopter. This helicopter is fast, agile, um, you know, can turn corners like it's on rails. Um, in the helicopter world, it's considered fast. It'll go about 130 knots. Obviously, if you're going to Florida, you want to take a commercial airliner. <laughs> but if you're flying around a, a city in an urban environment, um, we can get from one side of Columbus to the other in approximately five to six minutes, um, from one edge to the other. Most runs that we respond to um, were overhead uh, in approximately one minute. We can get there before the cruisers get there and let them know if things are really bad, there is a riot, or if um, a lot of times the bad guys are still there on burglaries and stuff like that. It's a turbine helicopter. It uses Jet A fuel, very reliable machine, and it has a Allison Rolls-Royce C30 engine in it, uh, 425 horsepower on takeoff, 350 uh, continuous uh, horsepower is produced. We have a lot of equipment on board that normal cruisers do not have. Right up front is a 30 million candle powered spotlight made by Spectra Labs, we call it the Night Sun. Um, you can focus the beam in tightly or spread it out as wide as a football field depending on your altitude. At night we use that a lot of times to obviously find the bad guys or to help officers search an area um, if they're looking for any type of shell casings or weapons or, or anything else. It, it does get hot, it'll set your pants on fire if you stand in front of it. <laughs> so if you want, want me to turn it on, I, you know, I can do I that. I need to go home, I don't want to go home it, naked. <laughs> right, right. And behind that is a FLIR camera. Uh, FLIR stands for Forward Looking Infrared Camera. It's a color camera and infrared camera, so we can video um, chases or scenes and, and document exactly what's going on in the daytime, daytime or nighttime. Obviously, everybody's seen on TV FLIR chases where, you know, whatever is hot, the item actually glows bright white. It's the same thing that you've seen on TV before. You know, about two, 3,000 feet with the, with the model that we have, it's still gonna be able to identify between a person or a dog or a deer wow. or, or something like that. We'll do a patrol altitude of about 2,000 feet when we're utilizing that camera. When we're utilizing the spotlight, we go down a lot lower. We're using you know, our own eyes to mm -hmm. try to pick up something, uh, which is obviously not as, as good as the camera. Um, doesn't zoom in, so we'll get down lower and use the spotlight. Inside the, the aircraft, it's a two-person crew. Um, we have a pilot and an observer, tactical flight officer. The tactical flight officer, um, believe it or not, it's, it's the hardest job um, in the helicopter uh, to do. It's not flying the aircraft, it's being the tactical flight officer. Um, he gives the pilot, you know, not orders per se, but tells him where to go, how high to go, how, how low, you know, slow, fast. Um, and he's controlling the ground units that are responding to the scene. He has a screen up here where he looks through the, uh, it's got a moving map on it, a GPS moving map with, with all the city parcels and addresses on it. Um, and he can switch that screen to, to utilize the camera whenever now, does, he wants to. Does that ever go down? Because I know like in a patrol car that I'm used to, GPS would they like, stop working. oh, it's down. So, you, you know, you just kind of like, sure. you know the city anyway, but it's like, does that ever happen where you like go up and you're like, well, GPS is down today. And you just kind of like going by what you know. Sure. We also have a map in the back if we have to look something up. But a lot of times um, the officers that come out are so experienced. They've been to many places throughout the city many times you get mm -hmm. you know the the udf at carl and elmore is being robbed again we are we all know where to go um, we've been there multiple times we know major cross streets 
um, throughout the city, north, south, um, and the east, west cross streets. Um, and then we can just ask them if it's a new neighborhood. Hey, how many streets south of Broad Street is it? Mm -hmm. And they'll tell us. And it's it's um, yeah, it's harder without the GPS, um, but it's not impossible to do. We have five radios in the helicopter. Two of them are aircraft radios. One specifically to, to talk to air traffic control, and the other one is um, on a downtown frequency, so that we can communicate with medical helicopters that are coming in and out. Um, our police radios. One's Ohio Learn which is all of Ohio um, that we just keep down kind of softly. They'll send out a tone if there's a pursuit coming in and out through the cities of, of Ohio, and we can monitor that. Um, we have another radio that we keep on scan. It scans the entire city of Columbus. And then we have the next radio is the one that we are over a particular zone, and that's the one that we're utilizing to communicate on. We have the capability of switching radio channels, talking to Ohio State Patrol, and talking to our guys switching back, and we can have communications between multiple agencies during a pursuit, going through Columbus and into another place. Now, is that the job of the TAC guy? Yes, or? yes, so very that's, hard That's job. a lot going on for him. It's a lot going on. It's very hard. Um, you have to know what to say, when to say it, what frequencies to put in there, um, how to use the, the, the aero computer moving map. We can move forward, backward, there's so much that you can do and then tell the pilot what you need him to do too. To get out here, I've been out here approximately 13 years now. To get a job out here, um, you have to be a police officer for a minimum of three years. And they do that because even if somebody's coming out of the military and they have a commercial rating and they've flown Cobras and Blackhawks, they don't know what police officers do. Mm -hmm. So once you're a police officer, for about three years, you'll know all the 10 codes. You'll know suspect movements when they back away and they're getting ready to run. And you'll see that from the air. Or when the officers enter a good fight, you'll know it. It's hard to see sometimes from the air, but you'll know just through your experience as a police officer. So the tactical flight officer immediately takes over communications for the officer that's in a foot chase, a pursuit or anything. And we take over the air and we'll let everybody know where to go and what to do. What does it look like when somebody gets tased from the air? You know, if you've never tased somebody from the ground, you're not sure. Hey, it looked like the guy tripped. No, he got tased. Get the <laughs> officer some help. You know, he was fighting. About almost three or five years before you're even flying the helicopter. Um, the first year, you're doing it, nothing but uh, observing. You're the tactical flight officer. And if you can't control a scene and tell the pilot what he needs to do and communicate effectively, you won't get trained as a pilot. You'll be has to leave. Get a year to prove that you can do that and there's a whole training program with all the equipment, learning the ins and outs of them, the spotlight, the FLIR, and all the comms, uh, and then you get all that full year's worth of experiment, experience with evaluations in between um, and that's something that you just have to pass. If you don't get through that then they won't, you're not going to be considered for pilot training. But you actually wear gun belts when you're uh, you know up in the air in case you need to land to like back up officers or respond to a situation. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Um, we don't have, we're, we're not permitted, it is prohibited to use force um, or shoot from the helicopter in our unit. Other, <laughs> other, other wow. units can do that, um, believe it or not. Um, other units have a policy and they practice doing that. We're not so concerned about that as we are concerned about protecting and helping people that are on the ground. Our primary mission is to support patrol. We do other things like surveillances for narcotics or SWAT. Mm -hmm. um, we find missing kids. We do all kinds of things. But our primary purpose for being here is to support patrol units and keep them safe. If a patrol unit is in the middle of a parking lot and they're fighting with a suspect um, and it's a one-on-one -on -one fair fight, well, we're not gonna let it be a fair fight. We're gonna make sure we win. If there's nobody close, we're gonna land and we're gonna get out there and help them get that person under control. That's awesome. Um, we've helped people with building searches and places where others couldn't get to, where we would land and the observer would, would, would jump out and, and he would actually help do the building search. So there's two people making it safer. The guns, we're required to carry them as a Columbus police officer anytime we're in the city and we're in uniform and we're in a police vehicle. So we're going to carry them. It's just kind of ancillary to, to what we're required. Do you guys have like long guns on board at all too? No, okay. we don't. We do have, uh, that's in, in the future where we may have a shotgun or an AR-15 or, or some style of weapon like that because 
and the, most of the school shootings will be the first ones there, will be the first response. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that, yeah. Like I said, we're over most scenes in one minute or less. So the chances of something like that happening in Columbus, it can happen anywhere, will be there in one minute. The size of the flame is a little bit bigger than my fist and it's right there in, the, in the, this can part. Um, it's not a very big flame, but the compressed air that comes down here Shoots all that hot air up through there, turns the turbine, which you might see. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> now, in the history of this unit, has anybody seen like a turd on the freeway and pulled behind him, like, you know, hit the siren? And got him to stop and then just landed behind him and like you guys get out and just like do a track stop. <laughs> I can neither confirm or deny <laughs> anything like that has ever happened in the history of this I, I, I get it, I get it, yeah. Um, but we have, um, you know, people racing on the freeway and stuff like that. Um, we've done something that we call Code 2, which is a verbal warning. Um, you know, you can utilize the spotlight light next to them and kind of shadow them a little bit wave wait put the spotlight on them and then they slow down go and we'll in, write that down as a code too but you don't go inverted <laughs> no inversion <laughs> in a helicopter is, is not idea. always a good idea yeah oh yeah um, i guess it makes sense this is what i say i would cry guys i just finished up a helicopter tour thanks in part to my boy aj here and bill who's not in this video at all but thanks bill <laughs> hooked us up and uh this was awesome you'll see some footage of us like uh the helicopter finding people involved in uh, various nefarious activities mm. we'll just say that and you'll see that uh, or have already seen it or whatever but anyway thanks for watching uh he loves you do it now i love you <laughs>